Hi guys, so in this video we're going to be looking at Log4j, what it is, and testing for the vulnerability. Sounds interesting? Then let's get started. Hi there guys, so firstly, a very happy 2022, happy new year to you all. Well, I'm sure over the last few weeks you've all heard about the Log4j vulnerability, which is currently taking centre stage in the cybersecurity news. And over the Christmas break I've had a whole bunch of people messaging me, asking me all about it. Now, I don't pretend to be any type of cybersecurity expert, but I thought I'd make a short video where I try to explain this vulnerability in simple terms, and also install a container on my Unraid server that has the vulnerability, and then with another container use that to scan the vulnerable container and see if it can detect the vulnerability. Now we've all seen the type of headlines with words to the effect of Log4j is a serious threat, allowing RCE and has a CVSS score of 10. So if you don't know what that means, well, it doesn't really mean much at all, does it? Yeah, obviously we know what vulnerability and serious threat mean, but just what is Log4j, what's RCE, and what the hell is a CVSS score? Well, I'm going to go through these backwards. A CVSS score, this stands for Common Vulnerability Scoring System. And it's scored from a number 0 up to the maximum of 10. So it basically says how bad a vulnerability is. And so the Log4j vulnerability is as high as it can get a number 10. It's critical. But what we've got to remember is although this number represents the severity of a vulnerability, it doesn't tell us how likely we are going to be affected by this vulnerability. I kind of think of it like this. Well, alligators are really dangerous and they can eat me and kill me. I'll give them a score of 10. And for you guys that live in areas where you have alligators, well, you're much more likely to be killed by an alligator than I am in the UK where we don't have them unless maybe I fall into the alligator pit at the zoo. Now I know most people watching my channel, you're probably running a home server. And so we're going to have to weigh up the risk of what we think this poses to us. What type of services do we have running on the server? And are these services exposed to the outside? Anyway, we'll talk about that later on. So what does this vulnerability actually do? Well, it allows for something called RCE, which is an acronym a remote code execution. So basically this allows an attacker to run remote code on the target victim's machine. So something we don't want to happen. So finally, anyway, what is Log4j? Well, Log4j is a Java library which is used in to do with logging. And it can take actions when it passes the logs depending on what's in them. So take a web server for instance. The web server will write information into its log. So if it has the log4j module sitting somewhere between, then it can take action depending on what information is coming through in the log. And so this is where the vulnerability is. And it allows an attacker to be able to run his own code by sending information to the log which gets passed by log4j and causes an action. And it's literally only one line which has to be passed through to the server. And this here is an example of it. In the curly brackets you can see it starts JNDI, which basically stands for Java Naming and Directory Interface. And this allows it to do a lookup, here saying do a lookup to the LDAP server at badserver.com forward slash payload. And so it will basically pull down the payload from this server and run it directly in log4j at the permission that log4j has. How the attacker gets this to log4j or the vector of attack can be different. You know when you go to a website and it can tell what browser you're using? That's because this information is sent in what's called the user agent header. And as you can imagine, this type of information is very commonly logged. And so this is a common place an attacker will insert the malicious request in order to perform the attack. Now you may have heard that Minecraft was actually vulnerable to this attack before it was patched. And you may have seen John Hammond's video where he runs this attack putting the command directly into the Minecraft chat and executing it that way. So basically, there's many different ways of executing an attack on a vulnerable system. So let's move on now and install a vulnerable container on Unraid and then scan that container 
with Log4j scan and see if we can detect it. Okay, so here I am on my backup Unraid media server. And let's go across to the apps tab here and do a search for Log4j and you'll see these two containers here. So firstly, I'm going to install the vulnerable container here. Now with the port number here, just make sure it's not conflicting with anything else on your server and click apply to pull down the container. And the second container here, the log4j scan, we're going to install this as well. So let's scroll down to the bottom of the page and click apply to pull down the container. So with these two containers installed, I'm going to go to the Docker tab and we can see they're both here. Now the container with the log4j vulnerability is running, but we can see here the log4j scan, it isn't running. And if you click on to start, it appears that it doesn't do anything and it instantly stops. Now this container doesn't have a web UI and the way we run it is a bit different. The container when it is first installed will have created an app data folder with nothing in it. Because it's there we have to manually create a text file which contains URLs of targets we want to scan. But before we go ahead and create our text file we need to change the permissions on the containers app data folder. And to do that, all we need to do is copy a line in the overview of the container. And so to get to there, I'm going to click onto the container icon and go to edit. And I'm going to copy this line here, the chmod line, as I need to change the permissions on the app data folder that this container's just created. So I'm going to copy that, then open a terminal window and paste that in. With that done, I'm going to hit enter. And now it's changed the permissions on this location here. Now it's important to do that because we need to make a file inside this location for the container to be able to work. So I'm going to close this window now and I'm going to open up a file explorer which is inside the app data folder and we can see the folder here that's been created. I want to go into here and now I'm going to create a text file in here called urls.txt and inside of here we can put a list of URLs that we want to check. So the first thing we need to do is check something we know that's vulnerable. So obviously that's the container we downloaded, the vulnerable container. And for the URL of the target that we want to scan, we need to specify whether it's HTTP or HTTPS. And also we need to specify the port number. So for the vulnerable container it's HTTP colon forward slash forward slash and then the IP of my server. And the IP for me is 10.10.10.10 .10 and the port number was 9100. So with that done, I can save this file and minimize this window. Then back on the Docker tab, I'm going to start up the container and straight away I'm going to go to the log file here. Now the first part of the log here is from when I first ran it and there was no URLs file, so it didn't run correctly. Now here we can see the second time it's run and it's telling us that it's found targets affected. Now obviously if you run the container multiple times the log file will just get longer and longer. So what I like to do before I run it each time is just toggle across to advanced view here and then click on force update and forcing an update will actually clear the log. So when we run it again the log's clear and we only have the log from the one time we've run it. So if I start the container and run it again and then go across to the logs and obviously because it's being run on that vulnerable container again it says targets are affected but the logs much more clear and it's more easy to see. Now I just want to say I didn't write this this was written by Full Hunt and you can see a link to the GitHub in the overview of the container I suggest you come and read this. All I did is just build the docker and put it in a container and make an unraid template. So all credit goes to Full Hunt's great work. Okay, so now I'm just going to run one more scan. I'm going to shut down the vulnerable container here because I don't need that now. And I'm going to test these three containers here, the Crusader, Minecraft and MB. So I'm going to open up the text file. And you can see here that I've already put the URLs and the port numbers of each of the containers in here. This is Crusader, this is Minecraft and this is MB. So I'm going to save this file and now I'm going to run log4j scan again 
and go to the log file. Okay, so we can see here some of the ports we ran the scans on, they didn't respond. But the good news is at the bottom, it says targets do not seem to be vulnerable. Now, one thing to notice is this version of Minecraft is a few months old. I deliberately installed this one. So this is a version of Minecraft that was vulnerable. So you might be thinking, well, how come it didn't pick it up? Well, if you remember in Minecraft, the payload was delivered through the Minecraft chat. It wasn't delivered through a header. So basically the program log for JSCAN didn't pick this up. That's just something to be aware of. Okay, so basically what can we take from all of this? Well, obviously I think one of the main things is we always need to keep all of our containers up to date. And we should only expose things to the internet that we really need to be exposed. Some people seem to want to expose everything, I don't know why. But only expose things that you're actually going to use and you actually need. So if your server doesn't have anything at all exposed to the internet, well, you've got nothing to worry about from Log4j. And if you're just running, say, MB or Plex exposed to the internet, well, I'd say you've probably got no worries as well. Anyway, guys, I hope you found this interesting and you know a little bit more about Log4j than you did when you first started watching this video. And if you like this video, then please give it a like, subscribe to the channel and share this video with anyone who you think might find it helpful. I want to give a really big thank you to all of my Patreons and supporters out there. Thank you so much guys for supporting me and enabling me to make these videos. Well again, Happy New Year to all of you out there. Well I've got to go now, but whatever you're up to for the rest of the day, I hope it's good and I'll catch you in the next video.